Hi, guys. Welcome back to yet another uh, podcast by University Elite, where we have Jerem and I. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about one of the questions that uh, came to me. I, I was talking with a with a lady, and uh, she's not the only one. I've had many people with the same question. And, and their question to me was, why do you not take insurance? Uh, uh, what is it about insurance that you won't take it? And, and she actually made the comment that I've heard many times, is it because you want to make more money? And she was shocked when I said, actually, I could probably triple or quadruple what I make if I took insurance and, and push pills like most uh, psychiatrists. And uh, she was a little surprised when I taught her that it's actually, I make less money by not taking insurance. And, uh, and then she was dumbfounded by, by the things that I pointed out and also by the, um, my reasoning for not doing it. So today, we're actually going to show transparently exactly what happens with insurance and why I, do, I don't take it and uh, explain why this is uh, one of the major keys to me being able to help people to get better than they imagined they could be. So uh, kind of a different topic, but it's on everybody's mind. So let's, let's jump into it. How you doing, Jerem? I'm doing well. This sounds interesting. That surprises me too, actually. Three times what you're making now if you took insurance. Yeah, yeah, it's it's quite a bit more if you take insurance um, and just uh, and and run it the way insurance wants you to run it. Um, you can you can really make a lot of money if you become effective. Um, yeah. And so uh, that's where that's where even a little bit of business sense and um, and you can become very wealthy uh, being an insurance accepting thing. But uh, as you'll discover the reason I don't is it hurts the patient's health. And I didn't become a doctor for the money. I could have made a lot more money in business or becoming an attorney. Instead, right. I did it to help people. So, right. so. Uh, It's kind of ca counterintuitive. And I remember before I got into marketing, I didn't understand that. I was like, why in the world would insurance companies want to pay more? And then I got into marketing and I realized you need repeat business. You need to convince people that they need you. and and make it expensive so that they think, oh, you've got to have insurance to be able to afford any of this stuff. And so it's interesting to see how it all comes around, actually. And if you, you look at the history of it, the history of insurance is actually very telling. Up until the 1950s, insurance really didn't exist. Uh, you'd go to the doctor and you'd negotiate a price and you'd say, hey, I need these services. And they'd say, I can do it for this. And and you negotiate, and that was the price you paid for your medicine. It was in the 1950s that a couple of very shrewd businessmen realized, hey, what if we got a bunch of people to buy this product to where they pay a little bit in each month, and then they won't realize how much they've paid if we spread it out over time. They will have paid a lot more than if they just paid it on their own as they went. Yep. Uh, excuse me, if they paid it all at once, it would be much cheaper. And if we get them to pay a little bit as they go along, in the end, we can make a lot more money. And they saw massive profits. And thus, the modern day insurance company was born. And they were incredibly intelligent how they market it. And they said, go to the doctor and don't worry about what it costs. You already paid your insurance. What they didn't tell their patients was, oh, you're paying the services you've got from the doctor, generally, they're a lot less than what it would have been if you had just paid cash up front. You paid us twice as much or three times as much just to be able to have that psychological blanket of having insurance. And then they, then they pointed out, and if something terrible happens to you, which 99% of the population, it doesn't happen to them, thus the reason that when it was higher than than one percent, we saw what it does to the to the medical system with the COVID nineteen. Right, it just overwhelmed us, and so the whole model of insurance is based on you're going to pay more for your insurance premiums than you spend, and it's less than one percent will actually be the ones that need that catastrophic coverage. But we're going to use a slick psychological trick to teach you hey you don't even see it happening and thus the reason that insurance was really wise to have you take that out before you received your paycheck 
So there's a lot of psychological tricks right now from the insurance industry to hide what's really going on with it. And um, sadly, uh, society as a whole has bought into this is the only way to do it. And we're seeing uh, we're seeing um, care suffer because of that. Right. Wow. And on the on that note of the catastrophic things, I think that but would it be fair to say that some of that has has gone up or the, the demand for the medical industry has gone up? I, I personally feel like we are a lot less healthy now than we were in the 1950s. There is more um, instance of cancer. There's more instance of um, chronic illnesses. And I, I was I was raised on homemade food right and whole wheat bread and now like raising my kids i'm like man in this society it's really hard to get through a day without just going to fast food and just relying on all these easy fixes and insurance kind of feels like an easy fix too and it's kind of like we've relinquished some of that responsibility for our health and said oh yeah there, there's the safety net net there that blanket that you that you mentioned and so we're just I, I think we're using medical interventions more now as a society than we used to. Is that at all fair or? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of truth in that. And then there's some things that, that uh, didn't quite hit the mark. Um, okay. As far as uh, longevity and, and disease, um, yes, we're actually much more healthy than we were in the 50s. Um, the reason you see an increase in cancer rates is actually because people are living long enough to get cancer, whereas before they were dying of things much earlier, infections, uh, uh, all that kind of stuff, dying much earlier, and, they, and that's the reason that we saw that uh, the actual life expectancy grow so much since the 1940s, 1950s. Um, mm -hmm. the, the medical advances during that time have been a true blessing. So, But insurance, you bring up a good point. In some instances, this is a big case of people uh, relinquishing control in order to not have to worry about it. In, in other words, we're saying uh, it's worth it to me to not know what's going on. Kind of the ignorance is bliss. And right. so that's kind of what we're going to do today is, is talk about the good of insurance. We're going to talk about the bad. And then I'm going to explain to you why I don't accept it. So first of all, the good of insurance. I believe everybody should carry catastrophic coverage. This means insurance doesn't cover anything unless you go in for something terrible that is going to uh, cost you tens of thousands of dollars or more. And then your insurance kicks in after that first 10,000 or something like that. The, I believe everybody should carry that. It's, it's really necessary in case you ever slip into that 1%. Now, the vast majority of people are never gonna slip into that 1%. And, uh, but it is nice to be able to just go to the doctor, pay your, your copay if you have one, and be able to leave. Um, and so that is convenience wise, there's certainly that and the ignorance that you're experiencing is bliss. And so that is nice. So what's the negative? That, that's really the big positive for insurance is, is the psychological uh, blanket that it gives you. Hey, I'm covered just in case. Right. Um, and the actual coverage in case something catastrophic happened. Yeah. Um, but now, what are the negatives? This is, this is where it, it's a lot of surprise for people. So if you, the way insurance, insurance has been very, very wise. People need to realize insurance is not in the business of actually paying for your medical costs. That's just a byproduct of what they do. They're in the business of accepting premiums or your monthly payment to have insurance called premiums. So their business is we accept premiums and the premiums make us more money than we pay out every month. So they are a for profit entity hell bent on making money and they make tons of it. In fact, insurance has reported huge amounts of lobbyists that give millions of dollars to politicians. Right. So there's quite a strong influence with the insurance lobby. So the first thing you have to realize is they are not in the business of paying for your medicine. That's just a side effect of what they do. They're in the business of making money off of 
having more money coming in for premiums than they're spending on the medical coverage. Okay. And a lot of people are actually surprised when they learn that of all medical costs you get, I've seen estimates uh, that vary, but it's somewhere between eight to 20% of your medical costs that's spent in the United States actually go to paying the doctor. Hmm. It's only, wow. and, and most of them, it's closer to that 8%. So you figure that's 80 to 92% of your cost of getting medicine goes to somebody other than the doctor. So what does the doctor get? That's what the first question we have is. And this is where it hurts it. So in order to be part of an insurance company, or excuse me, in order to be a doctor that insurance agrees to pay, by law, they are allowed to do this. And what you have to do as a doctor is you say, in order to accept your insurance, and I'm not going to use any insurance names today, in order to accept your insurance, we'll call it the Jerem Insurance Company. Okay. So in order to accept Jerem Insurance Company, I as the doctor actually have to sign a piece of paper that says, I accept that you get to tell me when you will pay me, how much you will pay me, and you get to deny paying me for the services I gave for any reason that you want. And if I want to appeal that and say, no, 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 I did what I said I did, you get to be the approval authority. I have to appeal it right back to the same person that denied it. So remembering that insurance mm -hmm. is in the business of trying to make money off of premiums, they have a vested interest to deny paying for anything they don't have to. Right. So what are we looking at here? So a doctor has to then go into an insurance company and say, okay, Jerem Insurance Company, I want to accept patients who have your insurance. And they say, great. Okay. And it costs me $100 an hour to keep my doors open and pay my secretaries and pay the billing specialists that, tr that send the receipts and stuff to bill the insurance so that you pay me for the time I did. So I have to pay $100 an hour. So if I see a patient... For a half an hour, you think, I need to make at least more than $50 an hour just to break even. And that's not right. even to make a profit so that that doctor has an income. Yeah. And so he goes into the insurance company and says, I want to be paid $100 for the, uh, the, the half an hour I'm spending with this patient. And if I do labs, it costs me $50. I want to get paid $75 for the labs. And so they have to negotiate each different procedure that they go into. Hmm. And so now the insurance company comes back and says, no, 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 we're going to pay you $45 an hour for that half an hour and 35. And then the, no, 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 that's not going to work. I'll go 80 and it costs me 50. So I'll go 80, 60. No, no, we'll do 50. And it, you do that negotiation. Right. Now you think you then once you've you've come to an agreement there, now you have to negotiate the next procedure and the next procedure and the next procedure until you've done them all. Well, wow. now that's only one insurance company. So what happens if you say, oh, other patients have another insurance company? Start over. You right. do the same rigmarole with every insurance. And so you see, what if you accepted 10 different types of insurance? Now you're spending 40 hours just negotiating that. And nobody's paying you for that. That comes off of your, any profits that you make. Right. So you can see how immediately the administrative burden that is put onto a doctor that accepts insurance takes away from their time doing medicine. Now, the other thing that will happen is many insurance companies will say, no, no, no. That procedure you're doing, that may take a half an hour to do, but we're only going to pay you for 15 minutes of their time. So mm -hmm. what is the doctor forced to do? In order to keep their doors open, they're now forced to go ahead and just get you in, prescribe you quick medicine, get you out under 15 minutes so that they're not losing money when they see you. Wow. And so as patients, how does this insurance negotiating lower prices to pay the doctor affect you? That is the entire reason the eight to 10 minute uh, med appointment happens. Doctors hate it. 
It's one of the biggest reasons that there's burnout and suicide among doctors. Mm -hmm. It's that the insurance won't pay you for anything more than 10 to 15 minutes. So when they come in and you don't feel like you've been heard, you can actually look at your insurance industry and say, thanks for not allowing me time with my doctor. The average time that a family med doctor spends with their patient when they do not accept insurance and they do cash pay, 45 minutes. Wow. The average time with your family med doctor when you use your insurance, how long are they actually in the room? Many times it's under 15 minutes. Hmm. Can you see the difference of how, so, so for, the first thing is doctors are unhappy that they don't get to spend enough time to educate their patients and help them to understand the why so that they can learn it. Patients are unhappy that their doctor doesn't feel like they're hearing it. And then they have to pay a copay on top of this. So you can already see it gets yeah. worse though. It gets worse. Insurance then gets to say, Oh, and by the way, unless you use an electronic medical record system, because it's easier on our end, insurance, we save money if you send it to us digitally. Unless you do that, we get to pay you less. And you have to, you have to accept these terms as a doctor. You can't negotiate out of it. So now all of a sudden, you're spending all your extra time trying to get their, uh, an electronic medical record to work properly. And you're, instead of spending that extra time with the patient, there have been many, many studies that show currently family med doctors spend two thirds of their day dealing with this administrative burden. And only one third of their day is spent with the patient treating them. Mm. Can you imagine why these doctors hate and leave medicine so quickly? Absolutely. Yeah. This actually hits kind of close to home for me because um, it, it's a different, um, different strain of medicine, but this is exactly how my wife felt with our first pregnancy. She felt that her doctor just wouldn't listen to her, wouldn't answer her questions. Would, and she ultimately at the very last minute decided, I'm not doing this. We're having this kid at home. And I paid out of pocket for that. And all five of my kids were, were born natural births, home births um, at home because my wife felt more comfortable with that because the midwives would spend all the time she, w she wanted um, going over this stuff where the doctors were just pumping it through exactly the way you described. And she was just like, I'm not doing this. We're, we're paying out of pocket for this and, and doing something that a lot of people consider to be pretty scary. And you, you see there how if you want this customized care, mm -hmm. you're never going to get it under insurance because the doctor right. has a choice. I can either lose money and go out of business, which I'll be honest with you. Before I went to medical school, I was an accounting specialist for a large school of medicine that had an entire – and the department I worked for was the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine. So I did the accounting. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many doctors – we got that came and worked for us for very little money because at least then they made a profit. Whereas in private practice, taking insurance, they lost money and lost their shirt. And now at least they had a profit and we worked them to the bone. They would work 60 to 80 hours a week and they were just grateful to have income. Wow. Not a lot of money, just yeah. income. And so, right. A lot of people don't realize just how harmful insurance has been to the patients getting that. Now, let's make it even worse. After the fact, say you've gone in and you have this negotiated price and you go and do that procedure, insurance, as part of that contract you signed, then gets to come back and say, no, 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 we don't like the choice of what you and your patient decided to do. Mm -hmm. So we're not actually going to pay you for that. You should have done something else. So essentially, they start getting to dictate, even though they've never met the patient. They don't know their life circumstances. They have no idea what was going on in that room and what the patient really could have used to get better. Right. And they get to then say, that treatment was wrong. We won't pay you for it. So now that doctor in the future has to do that treatment that some doctor that works for the insurance company that hasn't seen a patient in years gets to dictate. They have to do. And if you don't, then you get to spend a half an hour on the phone with them trying to convince them to pay you for that 15 minutes. Wow. 
in order to do it. So now they actually are practicing medicine and the doctor has to sign up and say, I will allow you to control my life and control the decisions we make the patients, even if that's not the best choice for my patient. Wow. Now, what are the qualifications and uh, credentials of these people making those choices for, for the insurance companies? So they do hire doctors, um, MDs or DOs. Okay. And uh, half of the time, uh, probably the vast majority of the time, but we'll, we'll go with some of the time so that I don't speak out of turn. Um, these people oftentimes aren't even residency trained and they're telling an expert who has spent years in that one specialty learning what's best and they get to tell them, no, you have to use this medicine instead. And the reason they're telling you that medicine instead, it's not because it's a better medicine. Can you guess? It's cheaper for the insurance company to pay for that med instead of the one that was better for you. Right. So that's the second that procedure question. Instead of the one that was better for you. They get to choose and, the, and they get to, after the fact, say, sorry, we're not paying you for that work you already did for that patient. So the doctor, if you accept insurance, now you just have to eat that cost. That was free time. Right. And in addition to whatever qualifications they have, what's their motivation behind all of this? Like it, I've, I've been told, so I can't verify one way or the other, but there are reports that these doctors get bonuses the more they save. So the more they decline payments, the, they get a bonus on that back end. That is their job description, not uh, we want to make sure people are getting the help that they need. It is the more you can deny someone the help that they need, the the more you get in a bonus. Allegedly. Allegedly. Okay. So I have a personal experience with that. I was working an inpatient psychiatric unit when I was in my training. And I had a patient come in and the cops had brought this, this uh, very troubled individual in. And this, uh, this individual, they had brought him in because literally running down the street naked with an ax. Oh, and wow. did not realize there was anything abnormal or wrong with it. You tell me this isn't a danger to themselves and to others. When right. you're running down the street with an ax, and, and we're not just carrying the ax, swinging it, you know, right. almost harming people, harming cars, you know, this is it. And so I brought them in, and this is one of the more sick people I'd seen. And insurance said you have to discharge them tomorrow. Wow. And I said, no, this person, I'm just getting them started on medicine at least three days before this can go in and start to help the neurons to function properly in their brain, yada, yada. And this person said, well, I don't approve it. And I literally had to say, I need to know your name and your NPI number. It means national practitioners. Uh, I don't remember NPI. It's identification number. So that's how doctors are. It's like your badge number if you were a police officer. Right. And only when I asked for the full name and NPI number, and they said, why do you need that? And I said, because I'm going to put it in the chart that I advised you that this was dangerous and could lead to somebody being hurt. And I want it in there. So when they come to sue, they sue you instead of me. Only then did this person, after half an hour, say to me, I'll give you three more days. Wow. Wow. Now, yeah. how many doctors for every single patient they try to do this are going to have time to spend an extra half hour for every single patient? Right. Yeah. So you can see this is why doctors don't sit down and figure out the why behind things. Yeah. Not only it gets worse, it gets worse. Who do you think is paying the hospital when you're a doctor in training? Insurance. Mm. So they have to make enough money to be able to pay the salaries of these resident physicians, the doctors in training. So how often do you think they're going to let you practice good medicine that leads to you taking more time than the insurance is paying you? You really think they're yeah. going to want to lose money? So what is the training teaching you to do now in residencies in most places? It's teaching you to do push a pill at them quick because you got to get them out the door so you don't lose any money because right. they're training you to actually be a viable doctor. This is what insurance has created. So now not only a doctor, do you lose the ability to prescribe the best treatment for your patient? 
but you're also losing the ability to be able to decide what it will cost. You're, you're losing the ability to, to um, have your free time and spend your time doing the thing you love, which are treating those patients. And guess what? Most doctors love educating their patients, teaching them why. So the patient goes home saying, I get it and I can implement this now. And so you take away all the good stuff there. Now, if you're willing to, and you're willing to just shuffle those patients in and out, pr prescribe like crazy. Um, I had one doctor who, I, who was a very successful doctor in my residency, and this doctor agreed to let me come learn the business side of medicine. This doctor made over a million dollars a year. Wow. And it was five to seven minute appointments with each patient and would prescribe a med. And I saw a lot of the same meds being prescribed in and out, in and out, in and out. And this doctor made over a million dollars a year. Wow. But this doctor also struggled with depression and anxiety so much because it was so miserable that this doctor had at times contemplated suicide. Wow. So what a miserable, money can't buy you happiness. That's the right. reality that I see. And so you can see I could triple my income, but it's not worth it. I right. wouldn't be happy doing that. And right. so you can see, so why then do I not take insurance? The first reason is, I'm not willing to play these games and say, okay, I'm going to send you these notes for this patient and hopefully you'll agree to pay me. And if you don't agree to pay me, well, I'll appeal to the same people that just denied me for whatever reason. And they don't have to have a reason. You agree that they get to deny it for whatever reason they want. And if you don't, all I can do is go to a government bureaucrat who's so overwhelmed called an insurance commissioner and complain. And if there's enough complaints, then they go to the insurance and say, stop it. And then the insurance just lays off a little. Right. So this is what we're looking at. So the first reason I, I don't do it is I don't want to spend my time doing paperwork. I want to spend my time helping patients. Now, the other thing that, that I didn't mention that's important to know Insurance also, when you sign up with an insurance company, most people don't take the time and get a lawyer to explain what they're signing. One of the major things you're signing there is, and the HIPAA law, which was heavily influenced by the lobbyists from the insurance companies, most people don't realize HIPAA allows insurance and hospital groups to share your information without your permission. Really? Only the doctors and the other people that have to get your permission. When's the last time your insurance company asked for your permission to data mine your medical record in order to sell that data? Right. Well, and it's most people who have heard of HIPAA have the impression, like I did until just now, that, oh, no, this thing called HIPAA exists. I can't even talk about myself. Surely they can't talk about me. You're talking about the Privacy Act which okay. happened many years before. HIPAA is called Hospital and Insurance Patient Portability, meaning you can transfer it, act. So <laughs> hospitals and insurance can actually transfer your information under this wow. act. And you sign saying you agree to that. The only person that stopped from sharing your information is me. Wow. So you can see how insurance is not your friend. And if you want real privacy, you're not going to get that with insurance. There are many reports and lawsuits that have happened and been settled by insurance companies for selling your information in ways that were sometimes accused of being unethical. However, much of those settlements, the... There is a non-disclosure agreement, so right. we don't know what they settled in there. Yeah, they settled to prevent us from ever getting to the conclusion that this was truly unethical. So you're so. seeing my patients, first of all, I do telepsychiatry. That way, my patients, they don't even have to be seen walking into a mental health clinic. Right. And we're not even talking about the convenience, just that. Second, I am not a HIPAA provider. That way, nobody can get your information without me or anybody else, without you getting giving me permission to share it. That's part of why I don't do this. That's part of why very successful people love to come work with University Elite because their information is not being submitted up to an insurance company for reimbursement. Mm. The patients that want to use their insurance for out-of-network reimbursement, 
they can submit that themselves. That's fine. That's your choice. But you'll never have me submitting that. I will not give it to anybody without a court order. Right. And so then thirdly, nobody except my patients and I, in most circumstances, uh, other than like a court order, nobody except my patients and I are going to be the ones that get to determine what treatment you get. That's the patient and I. The patient has 50% say, and I have 50% say. The patient can say, I refuse to take the meds you prescribe or the, do the therapy you prescribe or anything else. And I get to say, no, I'm not going to prescribe that for you. I don't believe that's right. We each have 50% and together we make a whole. Okay. That's because I don't take insurance. That's the biggest reason right there. And I, I'm losing money every single month by not taking insurance but I'm gaining the ability to always look in the mirror and say, I did the best things for my patients and together they did it. And that's one of the big reasons my patients walk away understanding why they have the symptoms, why this treatment's the best one, what the options were, what the side effects and risks are, and they walk away understanding how they can implement all that even when they're not with me. That's why my patients tend to get better when others don't. And mm. not taking insurance is the only way I can make that work. Right. So uh, that's that's pretty shocking. And yeah, there are other yeah, things. Time is not so shocking. It's like, yeah, uh, I, I can kind of, I kind of intuitively kind of knew that, but then hearing the details, it's like confirms your darkest suspicions. Yeah. And that's why that's why you're seeing such so many doctors now refusing to take insurance and so many patients are learning how to submit for their own out of book network coverage. Now I need to I need to take a moment and say if you guys are wondering how that works, at universityelite.com, scroll down to the bottom of the page. We actually have a video that gives the five-step process that most of our patients use in order to file. And so they can use their insurance. We're just not going to communicate or bill the insurance instead. We give them the receipts they need, and they can submit that up to the insurance company um, in order to seek reimbursement. And so that's where that's where uh, if you want more information on that, you can go get it off our website. But but um, cool. so that's those are the big reasons I found that um, patient care. I've been able to make such a big difference by not accepting insurance, and my patients absolutely love it. And guess what? Many of my patients. Uh, the vast majority actually do have insurance and will file with them with their out of network coverage to get partial reimbursement and so that it's even cheaper to come to me. But um, you can see that's one reason we've made our prices as low as we can in order to still keep our doors open and still pay a, a, a competitive salary. But our doctors love that their entire focus isn't about charting this way so the insurance gets it and spending more time doing charting and all that. Instead, it's all about patient in the room, how do I help them become the best selves? And, and that's why that's actually the, the real reason I don't accept insurance. Now, the other reason is when you sign with your, an insurance company, you also allow them permission to come audit your business and the medical records anytime they want. And they can then say, oh, we didn't mention to you that this would be disqualifying before, but we're now going to recoup tens of thousands of dollars from you because we've decided now, if you don't put this detail in the, in the medical record, you no longer get paid what we said you would. And they can retroactively come back and take your money from you. Wow. And so I've also been able to eliminate all those audits that take hundreds of hours by not taking insurance. Now, I'm still... That doesn't change. I am still mandated to meet the standard of care. My state licensing board is who makes sure that I'm doing good medicine. I'm right. still required to do good medicine to meet that standard of care. The problem for many doctors is insurance with that little amount of time, it inhibits their ability to do good care. It doesn't, it doesn't enhance it. Right, right. Well, and, you know, if somebody needs... Uh, emergency care if they get to a point where they really need their doctor and you're tied up in this fraudulent audit I don't know if I should use the word fraudulent but in a ridiculous audit that's taking all your time then that's that that's your entire 
clientele of patients are being affected by having limited access to the care that they need. That's right. And this and insurance, because they take so much time, that's also why it's often hard to get into your doctor. Mm. Because they're not spending their whole day trading patients. Instead, yeah. they're spending their day and instead of getting instead of getting treatment where it's um where you learn it well enough that you can help yourself and get better. No, you only have five to, to ten minutes with each patient. Well, then that patient comes back the week later because they didn't get enough information to be able to understand how to get better. So they had to come back. That takes another appointment slot. That's why it takes so long to get into these doctors that take insurance is because their patients aren't getting better because they're not learning the exact details of what they need to do to help their body heal. And so right. it's, it's just a perpetual cycle. And I hope this clarifies why. I won't take insurance. And I hope it clarifies why many doctors are actually sending out letters saying we're no longer taking insurance and they have direct primary care and as well as many other things. The whole reason there is we want to get back to practicing medicine. Now, there's one final thing that insurance used to do. This was a sneaky way, but, but um, it, was, it was something that insurance definitely did just to show you how care is not what they're worried about. For many times, I've read reports, and uh, I've read the actual reports, so th this information's been verified. If you saw a patient for free and you accept in insurance, you could be brought up on criminal charges for insurance fraud because it's considered discrimination that you would charge insurance for the patients that had insurance and the person who didn't have insurance, if you gave them free care, you were discriminating against those that you charged. Wow. And you could have been fined $10,000 per patient that you saw out of the goodness of your heart. Wow. You tell me how that is not messed up. Clearly, the insurance industry had no interest in the patients that needed the care most. If I refuse to take insurance, I can see anybody for free that I want to. And it's, here's a shocker. I do. <laughs> right. So. So I hope this clears up insurance. Any, any thoughts as, as we do that? I don't want to do too much. Insurance is a good thing, guys. I don't, I don't want to make it all bad. Those are the reasons I don't take insurance. Those are the reasons I won't participate in insurance. And so instead of, instead of just doing that, insurance is a good thing. If you go into the hospital, you need insurance. I carry catastrophic coverage for my family. It's necessary. You should do that. And here's the other secret that many people don't know. Even if you don't take insurance, your doctor doesn't take insurance, when they prescribe a medicine, you can still use your insurance to pay for that medicine. That doesn't go through the doctor. Right. You Still use your insurance for the labs. That doesn't go through the doctor. The only thing the insurance isn't paying for is that doctor's visit. So don't okay. think that you, you can't use it for everything else. You go to a hospital, still use it. It's only the doctor's fee that is not you can't use your insurance for. And okay. so that's a, so that's a good clarification. Prescriptions are still 100% legitimate. Everything else is really no different than it was otherwise. That's right, because what normally happens is your insurance company gets a, a bill from the doctor for the things they did, for the things right. he or she did. Mm -hmm. Then the pharmacy, they get a bill from the pharmacy for the meds. They get a bill from the labs from the meds. If you go to a hospital, they get a bill from the hospital for the hospital's treatment. All these different, if you go to physical therapy, the physical therapy does it. The doctor doesn't get a piece of any of that. It's right. only when you're in their office, that actual visit fee that the doctor gets. So that's where that's where you're looking at. Okay, great. The one last thing that I want to point out, because you said that you've done everything you can to keep the prices as affordable as possible for people who don't have insurance. And I believe that it's at universityelite.com forward slash webinar. You have a, uh, a webinar replay of a presentation that you put together that actually explains the the total value of what you build into those sessions and i believe the number for that value is somewhere around twenty two hundred dollars yeah twenty two at least at least twenty two hundred dollars um yeah and, and our, our psychiatrist 
uh, we, we actually, you know, if you were to go and get some of the psychodynamic and psychoanalytic work done that we do, um, most of the psychoanalysts that do this, they start at $650 an hour. Okay. We actually include that in ours. It's just part of it. Cause look, at the end of the day, university elite, we get our joy off of helping people get better. We, there's just nothing better than having somebody come in that said, I was thinking about killing myself to, I've never been happier and I don't think I need you anymore. I stopped doing the things now that I'm aware of them that right. made me unhappy. I've changed what needed to be changed. So that's, yeah, that's where it is. And that webinar, there's a lot of information that helps people see just how we're so different than, than anybody I've ever found out there. And it's, you know, and all the docs that come through, I personally train and then verify that they are up to snuff for what we do. And so, yeah, you can, you can get all that information there as well as uh, that gives you the secret web address to our assessment tool where you can assess me or anybody else to see if uh, we have what it takes to be an elite provider or if we're just kind of average and, and you might as well go to any pill pusher at that point. Right. Okay. Fantastic. So again, that was universityelite.com forward slash webinar. Yep. And um, the pricing is just a one little part tacked in there. It, it actually goes over a lot of other information and, and gives additional information beyond that. Um, but just to clarify, your prices are nowhere near $2,200 an hour. No, no. Okay. And, and you can jump on the website and see the pricing. Each, right. each doctor um, is priced for what we feel is a fair value. Um, and, and so you'll be able to see that. And, and uh, we have psychologists and physicians. And you'll be able to look on there and see what each one, uh, what each one costs per hour, as well as uh, what states they're servicing. It's it's, we've done everything we can to enable the, the patients to be able to do everything they need to on that site. Great, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Watson. I don't have any more questions. I don't know if you have any other. Yeah, it's okay. Well, but... That's all I have for the, for the insurance one. And um, hopefully this clears up why. I hope you guys start to see uh, some of the reasons. Uh, it's sad when people automatically assume somehow that uh, – uh, I've heard it a lot. Oh, you're just looking for money. And, and they're often shocked when they realize, no, I'm actually losing money by not accepting insurance. Because if you get good at pushing pills, getting people in and out, you can make a lot more money that way. Um, right. But uh, in the end of the day, all we care about is patience. And, and we, do like to, we do like to have the time with them that we need to. And then on top of that, if you want other stuff, there are other podcasts uh, coming out. There are other content. Feel free to log on to universityelite.com, explore it there, especially in that uh, online content section where we have more uh, more videos and, and content for people to get and, and get more of this. So it's, in the meantime, hope you're doing well. And, and uh, everybody out there, be well. <laughs>